How do you follow the artistic creator of one of the most enduring pop culture figures of the past century? By blazing your own trail. And that is exactly what John Romita Sr. did on The Amazing Spider-Man. We're going to look at all the Marvel Legends action figures created during his run on the book. Let's go! Hey y'all, and welcome back to Carbon Scoring the best place for action figures in comics history. In this video series, we're taking a look at all of the different Marvel Legends action figures that have been made of Spider-Man's villains and his supporting cast. In our first video, we looked at the characters that were made from Steve Ditko's run on the title. Ditko was Spidey's co-creator and original artist, and during his 38-issue run, he created an astonishing 24 unique foes for the webhead. But creative differences between him and writer-editor Stan Lee led to Ditko's abrupt departure from the title and left Marvel's second best-selling book without an artist. Stan Lee would repeatedly claim over the years that he had no idea why Ditko left the book, but that just doesn't hold water. The two creators had not been speaking for months prior to Ditko leaving, with Ditko turning in completed issues for Stan to script sight unseen. Those who had been in Ditko's studio prior to his leaving Marvel report seeing a bulletin board with all of the plot points mapped out for Spidey stories for the next several years. We're going to come back to why Steve Ditko left the book in just a few minutes, as well as a rumor that Stan was quick to spread, and the truth directly from Steve Ditko himself. But back to Stan's dilemma. He and Ditko had no communication, and Stan knew it wasn't a matter of if, but when he would need a new artist for Spider-Man. Typically, Lee would lean on his collaborator, Jack Kirby. But not only was Kirby doing the Fantastic Four and Thor monthly, but he was also filling in on numerous covers every month. Plus, Jack had shown that his style just wasn't the right fit for Spidey. Stan had to work fast. He needed new artists for his growing line of superheroes, so he reached out to John Romita Sr., Romita was an industry vet, having spent the last decade at DC working on romance titles such as Secret Hearts, Young Love, and Girls Romances. But Romita was burned out. He was ready to take a job in advertising until Stan's silver tongue won out. Soon, John Romita was penciling Daredevil, beginning with issue 12, and sales took off. Then, with issue 16, cover dated May 1966, Stan had Ramita draw a team up with none other than the Amazing Spider-Man. It was a solid effort, and while Ramita was clearly aping Ditko's style in his Spidey drawing, Stan had seen enough. He knew Ramita would go on to be the next Spidey artist. He wouldn't have to wait long. Ditko turned in his final issue two months later, and now it was Ramita's turn. And man, would that first issue be a doozy. Issue 39 of Amazing Spider-Man was a true turning point for Marvel Comics. So much so that Marvel Select would immortalize the cover in action figure form. The issue sees Spidey foiling a robbery on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. Let's give Ramita a break here by not asking where Spidey's web line is attached, since it has him swinging above the tallest building on Earth at the time. But as Spidey fights the goons, one explodes some kind of gas canister. Little did our hero know that it was all a setup by the Green Goblin, and that the gas has negated Peter's early warning spider sense. The Goblin watches Pete change into his street clothes, and then follows him home to Queens, where they do battle in Aunt May's front yard. The Goblin defeats Peter, and at the end of the issue, reveals that he is actually Norman Osborn, the father of one of Pete's classmates. As recently as 2017, Stan Lee told a comic convention audience that Ditko left the book over disagreements about the Green Goblin's identity, that Stan wanted it to be Norman Osborn, while Ditko wanted it to be someone completely random. Ditko has categorically denied this, and he has proved it by showing that he planted the seeds for Norman Osborn's identity by placing him in five separate issues during his run, each featuring the Green Goblin. Ditko has written several times in his 
cryptic style over the years about his departure from the book, each time focusing on issues of right and wrong. This is corroborated by a January 2021 Facebook post by comics historian Robert Bierbaum, who recounts as a kid cold calling Ditko in 1968. He wrote, First thing out of my mouth was, We've been boycotting Spider-Man since you left. When are you coming back? This evidently disarmed the man a bit. He laughed. He said he was never going back to Spider-Man. The publisher had promised a royalty if the book took off. Promise is broken. So there it is straight from Ditko himself at the time that it happened, and consistent with his lifelong principles. Issue 40 completed the Goblin storyline. Despite the drama surrounding Ramita taking over the book, I can't think of a more powerful way to begin a run on any comic. With the 41st issue, Ramita introduced his first original foe for Spidey, the Rhino. Russian thug Alexei Sienkiewicz undergoes an experimental procedure which binds an impervious hide to his skin. So he makes the obvious choice of a life of crime. Hasbro made the Rhino as a Build-A-Figure in 2015, but I actually think the old Toy Biz one is more representative of Ramita's art. No, not that one. Yeah, that's the one. Here's the Rhino's first cover from issue 41. That old Toy Biz figure is able to pretty accurately reproduce the artwork. Rhino was back on the cover for issue 43, with even more motion and action. I love the way Ramita uses the Rhino's natural abilities to whip Spidey around. And while Ramita was clearly trying to replicate Ditko's look for Spider-Man, his skills as an illustrator were immediately evident with the supporting cast, especially the ladies in Peter's world. Ditko had introduced Gwen Stacy when Pete enrolled at Empire State University, but Ramita took gorgeous Gwendy and ran with it. While other artists solidified Gwen's classic look, Ramita used her as a showcase for the fashion of the day. Props to Hasbro for giving us a terrific figure of Peter's first true love. I know I'd like to see more of the non-superpowered supporting cast in action figure form. But while Ditko teased Mary Jane Watson over a series of issues, We'll never know what his plans were for the character. But when Jazzy Johnny got his shot, he gave us one of the most memorable entrances for any character ever. Again, Hasbro came through with the lovely Miss Watson in 6-inch scale. The next original villain came in issue 46 with The Shocker. Herman Schultz was an engineer who crafted a pair of gauntlets able to produce shockwaves, and thus went on to a life of crime. And while his costume does look like it's made out of your grandma's old quilt, he's made our way into our collections a couple of times, including this 2006 Toy Biz figure featuring a wind-up Shocker action. The Shocker was featured on a couple of great Ramita covers, initially with his first appearance in issue 46, and again with this gorgeous cover to issue 72, where Ramita made great use of the spider signal. A third new creation from the mind of John Ramita premiered in issue 78, but this time, it was a 13-year-old John Romita Jr. who had the initial idea for the Prowler. Hobie Brown was a bright but angry teenager who intended to use his engineering skills for his own profit, but he was quickly stopped by Spider-Man, who, sensing a younger version of himself in Hobie, turned the would-be criminal into a long-standing friend and ally. This Prowler figure from Hasbro came in the Lizard Build-A-Figure wave in 2018. I'm a sucker for his purple and green costume, and the two dynamic Romita covers he appeared on really show this off. I use the website PickMonkey.com for all my action figure shots. It's free to use, but a subscription opens up a ton of features and makes poses like this possible. I've got a link in the description if you're interested. Plus, I may not be the only one who loved the Prowler's design. Naturally, Stan and John would bring back fan-favorite villains like Kraven the Hunter, the Vulture, and Doc Ock. But perhaps the greatest character originated during John Romita's time on Spider-Man was the Kingpin. Wilson Fisk would first appear in issue 50 as the Kingpin of Crime, a mountain of muscle who isn't afraid to get his hands dirty in his quest to take over the gangs of New York. His appearance was based off a combination of the actors Sidney Greenstreet and Robert Middleton. These days in comics, the Kingpin is mainly thought of as Daredevil's arch-nemesis, but he was the unifying villain in Lee and Ramita's time on the book. Their stories revolved around his machinations. Following that first appearance, Fisk would appear in 12 of the next 35 issues, cementing himself as one of Spider-Man's greatest foes. As the 60s advanced, 
The Amazing Spider-Man became Marvel's best-selling title, and the book was particularly popular on college campuses. Ever astute, Stan Lee took advantage of this, and the stories began to reflect the social issues of the time, as seen in issue 68, entitled Crisis on Campus, where Kingpin uses a student protest as a distraction. Tensions with the police were rising, and while Spider-Man had always been a misunderstood hero, never was this put into clearer focus than on the cover of issue 70, which sees the webhead backed against a brick wall, bathed in a searchlight as the police move in to capture him. Even the 60s pop art movement was evident on the book. I love how Ramita subverted perspective with this Mysterio cover, and this extreme close-up of Doc Ock is phenomenal with the reflection of a captured webhead in Ock's goggles. But the definitive moment in John Romita's run came in issue 50, titled Spider-Man No More. This comic panel was so iconic that Sam Raimi copied it to perfection in the second Spider-Man movie. Again, Spidey proves he is the most unconventional superhero of all time by celebrating his 50th issue by giving up being Spider-Man. So while we're missing figures of Kangaroo, Gibbon, and Hammerhead, Marvel Legends have given us the key pieces of John Romita Sr.'s epic run on Spidey. We're going to look at the characters created by Gil Kane and Ross Andrew in the next installment. But in the meantime, tell us what you thought of the video. Then hit like, share, and subscribe to Carbon Scoring. Thank you.